Good morning! It's great to have you here at Lawson Road for our online worship service once again. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time, we are particularly thrilled to have you and uh, we hope that you come back and uh, join us again in the future. You can also go back and look at previous worship services and previous sermons and sermon series all here on YouTube. If you're watching on Facebook, that's uh, easier to navigate on YouTube. Uh, I, I suggest you go find our YouTube channel and uh, catch up on stuff. I want to let you know about what's going on uh, this during this service today. Uh, we are doing something different as we've done the last couple of weeks. Uh, we will be having one of our missionaries or, or mission works uh, do pre present the Lord's Supper for us, lead us around the Lord's table when, when it comes time for communion. This week, it is uh, someone from the Baxter Institute in Honduras. You might uh, uh, remember, or, or if you don't, uh, I'll tell you that the Baxter Institute in Honduras is a uh, four-year school, and it is training people in Bible. And they, it is, uh, the students come from all over Central and South America. It's a Spanish-speaking school. And at the end of their four years, they will uh, go and work in ministry back in either their home countries or sometimes they go as mission teams to other countries in the region. Uh, so we have partnered with Baxter Institute for the last couple of years. And uh, we are blessed to, uh, to be led, as I said, in communion today by one of their students. And uh, there'll be a little bit more information later on. At the end of that, uh, John will uh, lead us in prayer uh, for around the Lord's table. So uh, just, just so you know how to navigate and what's coming up. We'll have our usual psalm reading. We'll have our songs. Uh, and, and I hope that you're encouraged by those as we go through. We're about to play a song. It's a good one. It's uh, kind of mission oriented as we go into uh, get ready for Mission Sunday next week. And uh, then we'll have our announcements. But this is a great time for you to finish getting settled where you are at home. And uh, if you are all settled and you haven't yet given us a thumbs up on, on Facebook or YouTube, please do that. That just helps other people find us, helps other people maybe learn about Jesus and uh, maybe hear the encouragement that, that they need. Because that's how the uh, algorithms, whatever those are, the mystical algorithms of Google and YouTube and Facebook, uh, they respond to likes and shares and follows. And so the more that you do that, the more that you help us get the word out about what God is doing through us here at Lawson Road. We're so glad to have you along and I hope that today is a blessing for you. Can you hear there's a new song Breaking out from the children of freedom Every race and every nation Sing it out, sing a new hallelujah Let us sing love to the nations Bringing hope of the grace that has freed us Make Him known and make Him famous Sing it out, sing a new hallelujah Arise let the church arise, let love reach to the other side. Alive, come alive, let the song Reaching 
ring out with a new hallelujah. Every son and every daughter, everyone sing a new hallelujah. Arise, arise, arise. let the church arise, let the church arise. Let love, let love, let it reach to the other side. Hello, everyone. As been mentioned, it is always good to have you join us with our virtual worship service. A couple of announcements before we begin. Each year at Thanksgiving time, we have contributed to the Greece Ecumenical Food Shelf to provide baskets for families who are in need. Last year, due to the COVID situation, uh, the food shelf asked us to provide money for gift cards. They have written us a letter and again have asked us to do the same thing this year. So, in order to be part of the giving for this year's Thanksgiving holiday, you can leave your donations with any one of the elders or you can leave a donation at the church office, whichever is best for you. Additionally, $20 gift usually provides for a family of two. A $40 gift provides for a family from three to five and then the $50 gifts used for a family of six to eight. So you can use that as a guideline as you give. And of course, as we send monies off to the grease shelf, we will designate, of course, the baskets that we'll provide uh, from the monies that are donated. Thank you for doing that. Second, the last Sunday in October is routinely our Mission Sunday. This is October 31st this year, next Sunday. And what we've done in the past is we've used all of the money collected on this particular Sunday to go to our mission efforts, both the missions abroad and the ones here in the States. And as I've always asked before, we like to actually double our contribution on that day to be able to provide a generous contribution that can provide for all the works that we support. So if you keep that in mind, please, as you prepare your mission contribution, be generous. And of course, we're so grateful for the way this congregation has always provided and as far as providing for each other. Thank you for doing that. Let's bow together. Thank you, Father, for our time to come together and worship. Please be with us now as we lift our hearts and minds and thoughts before you. Bless us in a way that we know only you can do. And as our spirits are refreshed, as we are made new and made fresh by the presence of you in each of our lives, we are grateful. So thankful for Jesus, our Savior, and for his presence at your right hand, interceding for us always. We love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we humbly pray. Amen. Splendor of a king, clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide. It trembles at his voice. Trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. And age to age he stands. And time is in. Hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The God had three in one Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God! Sing with me, how great. And all will see how great, how great is our God. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see.
Good morning, Lawson Road. Today I'll be reading from Psalm 34, verses 1 through 8 and 19 through 22. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord will rescue his servants. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. If I ascend to the highs, Lord, I find you. And in the depths of the sea, there you stand. From snowy mountains so steep to ocean trenches so deep, you made them, Lord, they are yours to command. So steep to ocean trenches so deep, I can, I can depend on you. In the warmth of the sun, Lord, I find you. And in the palest moonlight, there you stand. Sun, moon, and star shining bright, I'll tell the world of your might. You hold them all in the palm of your hand. Can depend. Depend, depend on you. Star shining bright, I'll tell the world of your might. I can depend on you. In the faith of a child, Lord, I find you. And in the love of your Son, there you stand. You gave your Son at such cost to save a world that was lost. Such love no less than my own could demand. Can depend, depend on you. I can depend, depend on you. Gave your Son at such cost to save a world that was lost. I can depend on you. Today we find ourselves in Acts chapter 25 and uh, as always I encourage you to read the chapter. It it tells this uh, fascinating story of uh, how the Jewish officials, uh, temple officials, lobby the new governor of Judea to allow Paul to travel to Jerusalem from where he was in jail, in prison, up in Caesarea in the area of Galilee down to uh, they say, send him down to Jerusalem and, and they have a plot that they're going to kill him. So we, there's a, a lot of passion on their part that even two years, after two years in jail, they still want to kill Paul. Uh, they really see him as a threat to themselves, I suppose, to the nation. Uh, but the, the Roman governor, the new Roman governor, Festus, he, he says... Well, he says, no, we've got to have some sort of a trial, at least a sham trial. We've got to pretend to be fair. And uh, then Paul appeals to Caesar. And that puts an end. It takes it out of Festus' hand. He can't send him down to Jerusalem. And so it seems like it was a desperate effort by Paul to protect himself, to stay alive, to keep alive the possibility of continuing the mission that God has given him. So that's it in a nutshell, but uh, I I really suggest that that you'll get value out of reading uh, this chapter on your own. One of the things that's interesting as we go through 
the book of Acts is, is how the author, Luke, likes to use patterns. And for whatever reason, the way that Paul's story is told in the second half of, of Acts, uh, it, it parallels some key points of Jesus' life uh, from the Gospel of Luke. And uh, I'm going to put them up on the screen here. And you can see those. Uh, first of all, both of their ministries begin with heavenly voices and baptism. Uh, both in uh, Jesus, they both happen exactly the same time. In Paul, they're a couple of days apart. But that's where things get going for both of them. At the end of, the, at the end of their ministries, they both take this journey to Jerusalem. And it, it ta it's not just a quick trip. It takes time for them to get there. Um, they both want to be there for, for Passover. Uh, while, oh no, sorry, Paul wants to be there for, for uh, Pentecost. Uh, so while Jesus, on this journey, Jesus predicts his death three times. And while Paul is on his journey to Jerusalem, three different prophets say, Paul, we've received this vision from God. And it's going to be really hard. You're going to be bound. You're going to be captured. It's, it's not going to go well for you in Jerusalem. They both have four trials. Um, for, for Jesus, it's before the Sanhedrin. It's before Pilate. Then he gets sent to Herod. Then he comes back to Pilate. For Paul, it's uh, a trial before the Sanhedrin, you know, with the... Um, in, in Jerusalem. And then he's taken up north. He goes and he sees... Uh, Felix, he then appears before Festus, and then Festus sends him to Herod Agrippa. And, and so it's interesting that uh, they both appear, both Paul and Jesus appear before the Sanhedrin, before two Roman officials or two Roman trials, and once before a member of the Herod family. And lastly here, they're both charged by the Jewish religious leaders with sedition against the Roman Empire. Jesus is crucified with the accusation, King of the Jews, uh, hanging above him, uh, it, because that would mean that he was a traitor to Caesar if he's setting himself up as king. And then Paul is likewise apparently charged with um, causing riots and maybe even undermining Caesar. And, and so in a very similar uh, vein of, of argument, accusation. And in both instances, we have Romans, uh, Roman officials who declare them innocent. So uh, there's this set of parallels. I could put up another uh, interesting chart of parallels between the ministry of Peter in the first 12 chapters of Acts and Paul in the second half of the chapter. That And, and and so I'm not real sure the significance of these parallels. I think it's in a way trying to give uh, additional validity to Paul and his ministry and that he is following in the footsteps of, of Jesus. Just because it's not that these things didn't happen, but the way that they're laid out highlights these, these parallels. So uh, although Luke's gospel doesn't go into a lot of detail, um, or, or doesn't describe at all the death of John the Baptist. Uh, you can go back and read John. It's there. It's in Matthew. It's in Mark. And I think it's in John's gospel, but it's not in Luke's, which is unusual. There, is, there are still some interesting points of overlap between uh, the, the life or, or really the, the trials, the imprisonments of John the baptizer and Paul. John was a vocal critic of a member of the Herod family, Herod Antipas, and his marriage. And you're going to have to stick with me through here. There's lots of Herods and there's lots of indis marital indiscretions and divorces and marriages and everything. But Herod, uh, this, this Herod there in, in uh, Mark chapter 6, uh, he had married his brother's wife. Okay, So he'd gone, he'd, he'd gone to visit his brother, and uh, while he was staying with his brother, he begins an affair with his brother's wife. The brother divorces his wife, or however they divorce. And Herod also divorces his wife, allowing Herod and Herodias to eventually get married. And they return back. To, uh, that, that happened in Rome, and they return back to Jerusalem. And so John is very critical of this. 
Um, for, for devout Jews, this was a great sin. In Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 21, uh, God specifically forbids a man marrying his brother's wife while his brother is still alive. Uh, so so that, was, that was very explicit, very clear, and Herod and Herodias don't seem to care. In, in addition, although they are rulers over the Jews, uh, they are not ethnically, or, or the Herods are not ethnically Jews themselves. They're a very complicated family. Um, Herod the Great, he's the first Herod. He's the Herod that is on the throne when Jesus is born. And he dies shortly after Jesus' birth. But he married at least 10 wives and continued to have children for over uh, 50 years. He lived a long life and had an awful lot of children. And so there are a lot of these little Herods running around as we continue on through uh, the Gospels and then through the book of Acts. So in, in addition to, to just being uh, part of this ruling family with the wealth and the influence that comes with it, uh, they're not ethnically Jews. Herod the Great was a Edomian, or a, a um, in, in the Old Testament, he was a descendant of Edom, an Edomite. And, and so they were historically enemies of the Jews. But one of the things that he did, he, sort of, he certainly ingratiated himself to the uh, Roman, to Caesar and to other Roman officials to sort of work his way up to a position of influence. Uh, but also... He married a, his second wife. Remember, he had 10. His second wife was a descendant of the Maccabees. Uh, she was a princess of the Maccabees. And so that, the, the Maccabees were uh, a, a family that had fought for Jewish independence and for a little while had established a, a Jewish independence there before they, uh, it, it became necessary for them to accept Roman uh, control over them. But uh, for a period of, um, a fairly long period, a uh, century or two, I, I don't remember right now, they were an independent nation. Not a wealthy nation, not a big empire or anything, but they were on their, on their own. And so he marries uh, Miriam, who is a descendant of this, really a royal family, a family of that brought freedom and independence to Israel. So they were very influential. And, and by marrying them, he marries into that royal Jewish sort of line and uh, gains some acceptance from that. It, it was like his Jewish credentials couldn't really be, be challenged, although there were certainly plenty of people who, who did challenge them. And, and on top of that, even though he had these connections, uh, his lifestyle and the lifestyle of his children was hardly that of a devout Jew. Here, Herod was the consummate politician. He, he came from this backwater in, on the, the uh, eastern shore of the Dead Sea, and, but he made, eventually made trips to Rome and is uh, lobbying with senators that he be given authority and a kingship there in, in Judea, in, in Jerusalem. Uh, so, so he educated his children in Rome. He sent them there and they would have sent, spent uh, their teen years uh, into young adulthood there in Rome. Again, making their connections, gaining their education and adopting their culture. So all of this to say that Herod's family is relationally complex and also culturally complex. Are they Edomian? Are they really Jewish or is it a conversion of convenience? Um, are they uh, Jews? Are they Romans? And can they be trusted? They're the king, but can they be trusted? And many Jews felt that the answer was no. So back to John in Mark chapter 6 and verse 20, we're told that Herod, uh, not Herod the Great, but his son, Herod feared John and protected him in jail. Yeah. So, but still protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, uh, he heard John speak, he was 
greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Okay. So Herod has John in jail. He likes to listen to him. He doesn't understand it or doesn't really agree with it, but it intrigues him. Eventually, though, Herod kills John as a favor for his wife, Herodias, uh, and who was also uh, a descendant of Herod the Great, and his stepdaughter. So that becomes like this, the first story where we have somebody on trial in front of Herod. Herod has a messed up marriage. He's married to his brother's wife. And, um, and, and he listens to John and, and is puzzled by it, doesn't understand it, isn't going to commit, and certainly doesn't become a follower of, of Jesus. But now let's come back to the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 24, which I know we talked about last week, uh, in 24, verse 24, we're told about the Roman governor. And, and there it says, several days later, Felix, that's the governor, came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish. He sent for Paul, who was in jail, and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ. Does that sound similar? I think it does. That uh, you've got this man of God in jail, you've got a, a governor, a ruler, he's got a Jewish wife, notice that we're told about the wife, and he likes to listen to Paul as he talks about his faith in Christ. So, Felix is an interesting person. He started out life as a slave. Uh, he was able to obtain his freedom and worked his way up through the ranks of the bureaucracy, Roman bureaucracy. And somehow he managed to marry three women of royal birth. Uh, the first was the, actually the granddaughter of Antony and Cleopatra. Uh, the last of his three wives was this Drusilla the daughter of Herod Agrippa. But when Felix first met this third wife, Drusilla, she was already married. And he convinced her to divorce her husband and to marry him. So, yes, when we're told here in verse 24 that she was Jewish, uh, from, she's from Herod's family, uh, that, that's true, she is Jewish, but she's really walked away from that in order to marry this Gentile governor. Uh, she's walked away from her faith. She's walked away from her uh, nation, in a sense, her identity, national identity, in order to marry a Roman who is going to take her off to his next posting, wherever that might be in the Roman Empire. So Paul, this Jewish Roman citizen, who is an apostle to the Gentiles, finds himself talking to a very complicated royal couple. Okay? And, and so I, th I, I think just at this point, uh, I want you to, to see that Paul himself is a complicated person. Uh, and we're speaking here culturally, okay? He's Jewish, and yet he's a Roman citizen. There wouldn't have been very many of those around, certainly not in this part of the world. Um, he's also an apostle to the Gentiles. Okay? And so now when he finds himself talking to Felix, Felix is a Gentile married to a Jew, uh, but a Jew that has left her faith, a Jew that has divorced her husband to marry Felix. Um, Felix, who has been pretty um, aggressive in putting down rebellions and is now on his third marriage himself. So all, all of this is, is going on. It's a, Paul is a complicated person speaking to complicated people. And so then we come to chapter 25. And in chapter 25, Felix is replaced in his role as governor uh, by Festus. And Festus doesn't seem to provide Paul any more justice than Felix did. In fact, Festus says, okay, well, let's do this whole trial thing again. We're told in verses 3 and in verse 9 that he's seeking to do the Jewish leaders a favor. Okay, so he says, well, I'll do this. Yeah, I, I want to do you a favor. So let's let's have a trial. And, and there's no indication there's a real trial. That, that 
he is motivated by this idea of favor. He wants to give the Jewish leaders what they want. And, and that makes sense, doesn't it? You're new to your post. You've just moved here. You want to get favor. You know, you want to be accepted as the leader by other influential people, the local leaders. And so you say, sure, what favor can I do for you? And they go, well, there's this prisoner. Okay. He says, ah, prisoner. That's small fry. Okay. And, and so um, there's going to be a trial, but it's really, I, I think, a sham. And so Paul gets wind of this. He sees the way things are going. He recognizes what's happening. And he says in verse uh, 11, he says, I appeal to Caesar. Okay. And this is a, a, as I said earlier, a last straw that the, the best way that the only hope that he has to avoid going back to Jerusalem, where I think he knew that he was not going to return from there alive. The only hope he had was to try and go to Rome. And I'm sure it was a strategy that he had thought about long and hard during his two years in that uh, jail in Caesarea. Festus is now trying to, has to figure out what to tell Caesar. Okay? Because he hasn't made a decision about whether or not Paul is guilty or not. In fact, he kind of, Paul says, you don't have any evidence. And he doesn't argue that he does. Uh, so why isn't he releasing him? Why is this escalating him? Why is it going to Caesar? And he has to come up with a reason. And while he's trying to figure out how to explain the matter to Caesar, he's visited um, by local royalty. Uh, King Agrippa, and it's another Herod, <laughs> you guessed it. Uh, in verse 12, a few days later, King Agrippa and Bernice arrive at Caesarea to pay their respects to Festus, the new governor of the region. King Agrippa is very much like his other Herod family members, and uh, he's arrived with his sister. He was the grandson of Herod the Great, and he has this territory, been given this territory by Rome that is north and east of, of Galilee. And while his territory doesn't include Jerusalem, the Romans gave him the vestments, the clothing, the special clothing of the Jewish high priest, and also the responsibility of appointing the high priest every couple of years. And so... Agrippa and Bernice had both been educated in, in Rome, but they were also, into, or Agrippa was intimately involved in the affairs of the temple. Who's going to be the high priest? And, and that, there were a lot of politics involved in that, as well as understanding the religious uh, ramifications and, and requirements of that role. And so in verse, uh, chapter 26 and verse 3, Paul says to Agrippa, he says, you are well acquainted with the Jewish customs and controversies. So he recognized Agrippa's familiarity as a Jew, even though he was a Romanized Jew, uh, that, that he still knew, uh, understood the customs and the controversies of Judaism. But again, this royal couple came with controversy. You see, it's interesting that it doesn't say who Bernice is. It just says King Agrippa and Bernice. Bernice was his sister. But she, at this point, she's about 22, maybe a little older. Um, sorry, by this point, uh, let me think, about 32 when she appears here. But she's had three husbands already. She had her first husband, which was an arranged marriage, a political marriage, when she was about 13. And by the age 22, she had divorced her third or her third marriage had ended. And she's single again and she moves uh, in with her brother Agrippa. But here's where it gets a little murky because there were plenty of rumors that uh, are documented and have you know, lasted until today that Bernice and Agrippa were... Um, not just brother and sister, but involved in an incestuous relationship. Later in life, uh, well after the events here, she uh, became the mistress of the Roman general Titus. Titus was the 
uh, general that besieged Jerusalem and then left and went back to Rome where he uh, became the emperor. And he was, they were all set to marry. Bernice and Titus were married. She would be like the first lady of the Roman Empire. But given the events in Jerusalem and the rebellion and the big battle there around Jerusalem, um, the Jews were really persona non grata. And so for political reasons, Titus had to send Bernice away and she went back to live with her, her brother. And that's really the, the last that we hear of her in history. So, did you keep track of all of those relationships, all of those marriages and all of those Herods? What does all of that have to do with anything? Paul's imprisonment and trials had very little to do with the legal system. Okay? They had everything to do with power, with money, with relationships. Um, even when Paul had a Jewish authority figure in the room, in the courtroom with him, it's a, a Herod, an unfaithful Jew of dubious ethnicity who probably only identifies as a Jew for political convenience, who is not living as a Jew, who's more Roman than he is Jewish, and yet that's who the ruler of the Jews is. And when I say is more Roman than Jewish, that certainly applies to their morals as much as anything. The complicated marriages, the um, just the the scheming, the divorcing, and all of that that goes on it is just a, a messy, messy situation. And so it's fascinating to me that in these trials, we're introduced not only to the men that are the rulers, but to their wives, to Herodias in John's trial, to Drusilla, who is... Uh, with Felix and to Benice, who is with Agrippa. All of them are descendants from Herod, and uh, Drusilla's married to the Gentile Felix, but the other two are married or, or are with um, Jewish, with rulers who are descendants of Herod the Great. You see, these Herod, these family members that were introduced to, to here have completely assimilated into Roman culture. Uh, they may go to Jerusalem for significant Jewish festivals, but they've long ago entrusted their future to the uh, wealth and the influence of Caesar rather than to the God of Israel. And so Paul, nonetheless, when he has the opportunity to talk to them, he offers them an invitation. He doesn't speak to them to impress them. He's not seeking power or influence or validation from them. And so here is where we find the great irony. One of the charges, the key charge against Paul is that he was allowing Gentiles into the kingdom of God. And, and that he was, in that sense, diluting the specialness of the Jewish people. The, the Jews could just become, the, the Gentiles could just become children of God willy-nilly. And uh, it, it didn't, didn't matter. Paul was like putting down the, the barriers to that. And Paul would say, yes, I am. That's true. And, and so the, the Jews are very concerned that they're going to lose their identity. And yet when Paul is brought to trial and before the Jews, the people that are uh, questioning him, that are examining him, are already Jews who have assimilated into the Roman culture. And so rather than being worried about Gentiles becoming Jews, these are Jews who have become Roman. And, and in becoming Roman, they've, largely, they've given up their faith, they've given up their morals, they've given up their standards, they have given up their God, they have hitched their wagon to Caesar. But Paul still gives them this invitation. You see, Paul could have rebelled, he could have resisted, against these people he, he could have um he, he could have said you're you're not uh, legitimate you're an illegitimate ruler you're an illegitimate jew you're an ungodly person uh you you have forfeited your right to have any say on my well-being on my future because you are, are no longer following god 
but instead he he sees these couples he sees these people as those who need god as those who are suffering as those who are pursuing happiness of those who are caught up in this tangled web of relationships seeking love and uh, and wealth and power as well i'm sure but paul says your lives are a mess You're disconnected from God. You're disconnected from your Jewish people. He says, but you still have this opportunity to turn away from Caesar and to to put your future, to trust your future to God through by following Jesus. And, And it's so easy, I think, for us to be intimidated by the ungodliness of the world that we we look at TV shows or we look at the rich and the famous and we see they're messed up relationships and they're constantly changing relationships and and we we say you know what's what's going on like that's so terrible like i'm that's so far from what god wants for people and and we can you know it's very easy then for us to begin patting ourselves on the back and thinking i'm so glad that i'm where i am i'm so glad that i'm away from that i'm so glad i'm not caught up in that But that's not the attitude that Paul took because he didn't point fingers at them and critique them. Instead, he said, let me tell you about Jesus. And so here's our bottom line today. As we look at these, you know, it's a mess when we talk about the Herod family. I don't really expect you to understand or, you know, draw out a family tree or anything. I certainly couldn't. Um, It's a mess. But the bottom line is that Christians are not saved from the world or not just saved from the world we're saved for the world okay we're to be light we're to be salt a city on a hill for the world because paul had every opportunity to beat them down instead he says let me tell you about jesus he recognized that his mission was to the gentiles to the people that were caught up in these ungodly lifestyles that didn't know Jesus, that, that had their priorities all out of whack. And the reality is very challenging for churches today because it's easy to, to adopt the attitude of saying, God, I thank you that we're not like them. But we don't say it like that. What we say is, God, thank you for saving us from being like them. And so we give God all the credit, right? And it sounds holier that way. God, thank you for saving us from that. And we we then talk about the evils and the dangers and the troubles that are out there. But we're in here and we're safe. But we're not just saved from the world. We're saved for the world. And, And so we're sent back out into that world to tell them, about Jesus, not to be intimidated by the wickedness, not to be intimidated by the ungodliness, not to be intimidated by the materiality, materialism or the sensuality that is so invasive, pervasive in our society. But to say we're here for the world. And how do we express that? Whether we express it through giving at Thanksgiving uh, to, to those that are hungry or at other times of year, whether we express it through giving to different missions that are, are around the world that are sharing the gospel of Jesus with people, whether we express it through our own lives and conversations, say, I'm in this workplace, I'm in this community, I'm in this neighborhood for my workplace, for my neighbors, for my community. We're in this church for the people around us, not to escape. From the people around us and and certainly we are grateful to god that he has saved us from a life of sin that that we are being transformed into his image and and that we have his spirit that helps us to resist temptation and to live a life that honors him that is all good stuff but if we make it all about us and all about what we're saved from we lose our mission of what we're saved for and i think paul here demonstrates in his attitude he had every reason to just criticize these people and their messed up lives and instead he saw people that needed jesus 
And that was what he talked about. Hi, welcome to the Lord's Table. This moment has a very special place every Sunday. We are sitting here in the God's Table to celebrate. We are remembering what Jesus has made for us, his sacrifice and resurrection. Maybe we are dressing in a bad way. Maybe we are had some fight with our neighbor, son, husband, or wife. Maybe we are just doing uh, that always do. But I want to invite you to think in this table. Please imagine that you are sitting in a table, looking around from your seat. And you see the king and his eyes are on you and you can read in his eyes I love you and I am happy that you are here after that you look around again and you see me <laughs> obviously I want to be there too and watch face to face each other and we said we say I love you I love you too Today, we are separated by the geography, but someday we all will be celebrating together in the king's table. I do know it because Jesus Christ has made it possible. He gave us a worthy clothes to sit in his table. He gave us each other as a family. The Bible says, in Ephesians 2, 13 and 14, but now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross. He broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. This moment, every Sunday, is a little taste of how will be the presence of God by the eternity. I am so happy to be here with you. This beautiful fellowship is a great time to rejoice for our unity in Christ. Thank you, and God bless you. Would you please pray with me as we give thanks for the emblems of the Lord's Supper? Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your love, for your great patience with us. We thank you that we, well, even though we are sinners, we are in the hands of a forgiving God. We ask that as we partake of these emblems today, that you would uh, please help us to remember all the sacrifices that were made on our behalf, and how much you want us to be justified. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you for joining us for the Lawson Road virtual worship service this morning. We're glad that you did. We recognize that if you're watching this, it's because you couldn't attend in person. We hope that that changes soon, that you are able to join us or another group in person very soon, but we're glad that you're able to join us now through this virtual time together. Please bow with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, it has been good to study your word. It has been good to gather around through your spirit together. It has been good to, to think the thoughts that encourage us and encourage our lives. We thank you, thank you for the ways that you have blessed us, that you have blessed our families, that you have best blessed our community, and that you have indeed blessed our nation. But Father, we need to, and we want to return back to you. We want to turn our thoughts, turn our intents to biblical principles that we would live the way you would have us live. Holy Father, we thank you that you do listen to us when we come before you. And as a family together today, we want to bring our cares and concerns to you. Father, we recognize that many are sick. We have had a, a number that have been diagnosed in one way or another with cancer. Father, that is a, it's a very terrifying event. And we ask, Father, that you would minister to them, that you would allow the healthcare workers to provide them relief and comfort and the families that would be able to support them as well. We ask for guidance for the medical folks. We know several have been uh, recently hospitalized, particularly uh, some of our older folks. We recognize that going to the hospital is generally a fearful event. And we ask, Father, that the families would be allowed contact so that they could encourage them. Father, that the medical people would be able to have a clear path forward, would be able to treat successfully the situations that they would be returned to their health. Heavenly Father, we ask also for Simple delivery from, from what we deal with with this COVID. Our world has changed so drastically in, in the near two years that we've dealt with it, and we don't like it, and uh, we're very tired of it. And Father, we ask that you would grant us wisdom, that we would uh, conduct ourselves in a manner that, that we would uh, seek to stay as healthy as possible and respect others' health as well. We ask, Father, especially that you would allow us to claim as in 2 Timothy chapter 1, that you did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And Father, we ask that we would spend the rest of this day, indeed this next week, that we would indeed live in your power, that we would show forth your love. And Father, we ask for clarity and a sound mind that we would conduct ourselves the way you would have us. Father, we ask for your blessings of your wisdom. We ask for your comfort. We ask for your guidance. We're particularly concerned as our children are in school. We ask, Father, that you would keep them safe, that you would grant the teachers wisdom to encourage, to guide, and to help heal the troubles that the kids have now because of the, because of the COVID and other issues and the violence in our communities. Father, we ask for delivery from that. Moreover, Father, we rest in your love. We ask that, that you would be very close to, to us this next week, that indeed we would be close to you, that our thoughts would center on you, and Father, that we would spend our time together with you daily and in an encouraging manner for us. Heavenly Father, I thank you that we can come before you. I thank you that we can simply share our heart's desires and our concerns and ask that you would guide us Guide us this day, guide us this week. We praise you, we thank you. Through your son Jesus, I pray, amen. It's just time for one more thing. I'm glad you stayed around until the, until the very end. And I, I've gotta be honest with you. Can I be honest with you? Um, the end of Acts has a lot of repetition in it, and so it's difficult to come up with sermons and uh, make fresh observations week after week as we come to the end of the book. And, and so sometimes we, it, it helps to step back and say, rather than just looking at the particular words and, and getting caught up in the Roman governors, you know, who was Felix, who was Festus, who was Agrippa, how was... What's the point? 
Why is this told to us? Why is it included in scripture? And one of the things that I see here in the book of Acts, as we get to the end, Paul is in Caesarea, uh, which is the Roman capital or seat of government in the province of Judea, not Jerusalem, which is down the south, but Caesarea up in the north. And Paul is in prison there for two years. So it's coming up. I don't know when, but, but well, soon, but I, I, we're what, getting closer to two years of COVID. And some of us are still feeling like, hey, I've been in prison a really long time uh, in my own home. Well, Paul was in prison for two years. And what is remarkable, I think, about this is that Paul doesn't appeal to Caesar any earlier. He, he rides it out. He, he stays in prison for that whole time. He interacts with the governors. He tells his story. He talks about Jesus. He defends himself at a series of trials over that two years. And it, it's difficult. And yet he is faithful to God. When, when Fe, uh, Festus in this particular week has this story, you know, explains to Agrippa what's going on, he talks about Jesus. He says, look, this guy Paul thinks that Jesus is alive. He doesn't understand very much, but he understands that Paul thinks that Jesus is alive. Paul has managed to communicate his faith, his, the, the center of his faith, the resurrection of Jesus, in just the short amount of time that he has spoken with Festus. So throughout that two years of injustice, of oppression, of uh, corruption in the legal system, of a change of judges, Paul is just stuck there. Two years of his life gone, and yet he remains faithful to Jesus, faithful to God. And, and I think that's an encouragement for us. Yes, life is difficult sometimes. Sometimes it's difficult for a long period of time. And it's none of our fault. It's just the way things are. And yet God is still God. And we are encouraged to remain faithful to him, to allow him to, to uh, strengthen us for his spirit, still to encourage us and to give us hope that there is something better ahead of us, that our relationship with God is more important ultimately than our circumstances, even though our circumstances can be difficult. So I don't want to keep going. One sermon's enough for the day. But I, I do think that, that seeing this, thinking about this two-year period that we've been covering over the last few weeks uh, can help give us an encouraging perspective for our circumstances today. I hope this week is a good one for you. And as you go, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. God bless. I still have joy, joy, I still have joy.